call the Agriculture, Finance, and Policy Committee to order on March 21st, 2023. I believe we have a quorum present. Uh, we'll first move the approval of minutes. Uh, Vice Chair Purcell. I move approval of the minutes from uh, March 16th. All right, Representative Purcell, move the approval, approval of the minutes for March 16. Discussion? Those hearing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails, so the minutes from March 16 are approved. Uh, members, I also want to recognize that there's a Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation Day on the Hill today. Uh, thank you to uh, the Farm Bureau for being here. So it's always a pleasure to see all of you. Uh, I believe we have uh, the, the president, Dan Glessing, who would like to say a few uh, remarks. If you can please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Sure. Well, thank you. Dan Glessing, service president of Minnesota Farm Bureau, uh, a crop and dairy farmer from just west of the Twin Cities. Um, just wanted to, to say happy National Agriculture Day. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the tractors out front of the Capitol here, but it really is a, a nice way uh, for our members to tell their stories. We have over 120 members here today. And uh, just to celebrate agriculture, there's, a, there's, only, there's less than 2% of us that farm, but 100% of us eat three times a day. And so that's a job that we don't take very lightly and uh, just appreciate all that you do for agriculture in this room and beyond. And uh, if you haven't seen any of our members, I hope that you, uh, you will have a chance to visit with them because they do have a great story to tell. So, but appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Glassing. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move to our first bill on the agenda, uh, which is House File 1587. Uh, members, this is the Ag Policy Omnibus Bill. Uh, we won't take any uh, formal action today besides adopting the DE, uh, and then we'll do the uh, another, we'll just focus on the walkthrough today, and then the next uh, passage for this bill will be on Thursday. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Purcell. When you are ready, Representative Vang, if you would please move your bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, members, this is, as I said earlier, this is the um, Ag Policy Omnibus Bill. Um, and I also have the DE that I would like to move before the committee. Okay, Representative Vang moves our DE amendment to House File 1587. Uh, all those in favor of adopting the DE amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The DE is adopted. Um, now please, uh, to your bill, Representative Vang. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this is the D, uh, to the DE to House File 1587. Uh, there is about uh, six other provisions on there. The so the first uh, provision is regarding uh, allowing the commissioner to have a designee to uh, catch a wild pig if necessary. Uh, and. The uh, second provision uh, allows, um, uh, talks about uh, the non-native fag mites. Uh, section five through nine uh, talks about uh, genetic, genetically modified organisms, the nurseries and plant protection, dairy law enforcement, um, and uh, uh, repealing um, a section of the dairy law on and these are policy bills that we've heard earlier uh, this session. Um, and if members have any questions, I'm happy to take any questions. And we ha also have staff from the department who can help answer any questions too. Thank you, Representative Vang. Discussion to the bill. Um, Representative Vang, your, I don't know if it's your microphone. Uh, maybe if you can switch microphones or get a little bit closer. Yours seems to be significantly quieter than the rest of ours. Okay. I want to make sure we can hear you. Sounds Discussion good. to the bill. Yes, Lee Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, not quite sure if you've gone through the entire bill yet. If you haven't, I can wait. But my question is on Section 61, Madam Chair. I think we need to have the department give us uh, some indication of how they're going to handle testing uh, on a detectable level. That's a big, big change, a big jump from uh, current uh, statute. So could the department, if anybody is here, tell us if they're capable of and the additional expense of uh, this new level of detecting uh, chemicals in nursery stock? Uh, thank you, Lee Anderson. I uh, am remiss because we have testifiers, and I did not ask for testifiers to come up. Uh, so I believe um, if, if we can come back to your question after we hear from our testifiers. Um, the first testifier, Lori Cox, who's over Zoom. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you much, um, uh, Madam Chair, um, Chair Bang, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of MDA's expansion of the Emerging Farmers Office and its associated initiatives in this agriculture omnibus bill. I moved to Carver County over eight years ago and lease our land and farm operation. I fit the definition of new beginning farmer and transitioning farmer. This year I entered into a partnership pilot with Big River Farms, a farmer incubator. This pilot enables farmers experience with their education program to lease directly from me with mentorship if needed, but nearly no oversight. This type of food and fiber production takes immense knowledge of planning, business acumen, physical labor, costs quantification, soil structures, irrigation, crop types and availability, equipment needs, land layout, markets and sales channels, logistics, and direct marketing, so we enable their independence. The office works with non-tribal and tribal communities alike. MDA recognizes barriers associated with these goals and created the office of one potentially serving thousands. Everyone can agree that's not sufficient and is now a time of agency and strategic planning. These are not producers with generational land with used equipment ready to be transferred. These are emerging farmers, some new to Minnesota. Everyone wants farmers to know they are supported. Additionally, MDA created the Emerging Farmers Working Group dedicated to this cohort voice, just as other groups advocate for their own efforts. We have some momentum and can't slow down now. There will always be emerging farmers. If COVID taught us anything, it's that we don't have nearly enough locally produced and accessible foods throughout Minnesota. This office expansion will help change that and is a win for all communities, rural, suburban, and urban. This committee's support shows your love of all agriculture and National Agriculture Day is every day. With decades of support behind other types of farming, this is past due. With your yes vote for the Emerging Farmers Office expansion, there will be more local foods, stronger economies, food security, and more farmers for generations. I humbly ask for your support for all Minnesotans in this Ag Omnibus Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our second testifier is Stu Laurie from Minnesota Farmers Union. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Purcell and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Stu Laurie and I'm Government Relations Director for Minnesota Farmers Union. And I just wanted to share our, our brief support for HF 1587 as amended and particularly um, as it includes uh, your bill, uh, Chair Purcell, HF 1314, which bans confidentiality clauses in carbon market contracts. This mirrors longstanding law that prevents confidentiality clauses in ag production contracts. Um, it also mirrors the Senate uh, policy bill, which we're uh, very grateful to see. Basic transparency is a good thing. It's going to help protect farmers and inform best practices in the industry. And um, we very much appreciate um, that bill's inclusion. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else from the public who wishes to testify for or against the bill before we return to Lee Anderson's first question of member discussion? Anyone from the audience today? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll return to uh, Representative Anderson's question, and I believe um, it's on page 23 of the bill, line 23.27. Um, that's the, the change to has the detectable level, correct? And maybe someone from the Department of Agriculture can approach the stand. Thank you. Identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Peter Chesset, Assistant Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. 
Uh, Representative Anderson, we have been working with uh, Representative Purcell on language to determine some sort of uh, level between detectable and what the EPA currently requires. Uh, we haven't had a chance yet to, to uh, have a meeting with Representative Purcell on that specific language. That'll be happening soon, but I can say that we have uh, a proposal that would use the pollinator protective reference values that the EPA publishes as kind of a baseline for that conversation in terms of uh, determining what uh, level of detection we could we could go to. Reed Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I think we're going to act on this bill by Friday, so I would hope that uh, you'd have a meeting soon and to come to some agreement because it is a it's a uh, a point of concern for those that. Uh, will be affected by this and the, I think it also puts an added impact, uh, financial impact on the department to what level you go to. So I uh, wish you well and come to an agreement. Uh, thank you, Lee Anderson. Point well taken. Other comments, discussion to the bill? Thank you, Mr. Jetson. Seeing none, uh, any closing remarks? Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, I'm happy to uh, be carrying this bill and uh, looking forward to your support. <coughs> Wonderful. Okay, thank you, and uh, we, will, we will have further discussion on this bill <coughs> later in the week. And uh, now I will pass the gavel back to Chair Vang. All right, members, our next bill on the agenda is, uh, agenda is House File 2387, Representative Hansen. And whenever you're ready, Representative Hansen, uh, please move your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move House File 2387 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. All right, and two, I see that you, we have an author's amendment to the A1. Uh, would you like to move that amendment? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'd move the A1 amendment. Uh, what it does is it fills in the blanks uh, with uh, the license fee and also for the cost of having the agencies work together and have a public meeting uh, to make that work. I'd ask for your support. All right, to the amendment. Discussion to the amendment. Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of adopting the A1 amendment, say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The ayes have it, the motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, now to your bill, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, we've uh, heard discussion about uh, costs and regulation relating to both feral hogs and uh, the fur farmers uh, earlier uh, throughout this session. Uh, you know, we have three agencies that have pieces of the regulation regarding this. And what this bill essentially does is it's asking them to look to get, work it out. Uh, the world has changed a lot since we originally had these passed. So you have the Board of Animal Health, uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and the Minnesota Department of DNR. They don't always agree, but these are uh, two things that are very important during uh, COVID. Uh, mink farming uh, internationally was a, a big issue. The current uh, fee is $10 and hasn't changed, I believe, since 1985. So bringing that up so there's actually a cost recovery for what it takes for regulation. On the feral hogs, uh, we've discussed before that there are uh, hybridized feral hogs in Canada that may be moving across. The impact of that uh, for our domestic hog herd would be uh, devastating because they could carry the disease as well. So um, I don't know if the department would like to talk. I, earlier, I think it asked Commissioner Peterson uh, about their interest in this, and it will be heard this afternoon on an informational basis and environment as well. All right. I see we have some testifiers. Uh, first testifier is Chalice Hobbs, Executive Director from Fur Commission USA. Hey, yeah, good afternoon. 
Uh, thanks for the time, Chair and, and committee members. Uh, so yeah, I am I am the direct, the executive director of the Fur Commission. We represent the fur farmers throughout the U.S. Um, and I, I we are opposed to this bill HF twenty three eighty seven um, because it does feel uh, duplicative and uses resources unnecessarily. And why I say that is because if you're looking for for farmer, uh, fur farmers' names, uh, locations, you know, the species that they're raising, among other information, you, you don't need to mandate a registration for this as it's already readily available. So the USDA does an annual mink survey um, conducted each spring for all the fur farmers, and it measures inventories, production, values. And then additionally, the Fur Commission Director Halps, if you can please speak into the mic a little bit more. It's, we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Can you hear me better now or? Slightly better. Okay. I'll just try to talk louder. Um, so the Fur Commission, we also register all the fur farmers annually. So we can we have all the information that you guys are looking for in this bill. Um, so I guess in summary, the information you guys are looking for is already readily accessible through the USDA and then us, the Fur Commission USA. So I, we don't feel that there's an, a need to mandate um, this. And then what one part we had a question on too was on section three in the bill, it would mandate that, there, that the commissioner would give the chair and certain ranking minority member or my, uh, members a report on mink but I'm curious if this is farmed mink or wild mink. Um, and regarding the, the public health concerns, um, we're, we're right now the all that so that we're in a, a program with the farm surveillance COVID program with the USDA and APHIS. We have been for the last eight months and we're just renewing contracts to continue with them to do that. Mr. Hobby, uh, if you can please uh, wrap up your testimony. Yes. So in conclusion, yeah, it, it does. Yeah, we'd like clarification on that on section three. And then, um, yeah, we are opposed to this because it does feel duplicative. And, and the information you're looking for, we can give you. All right, thank, thank you, you, Director. Our next testifier is AJ Durr. If you can please identify yourself before the committee and proceed. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Andrew Dewar, and I'm here today representing the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. Uh, here today to testify in uh, support of House File uh, 2387. Sorry about that. Um, as, as Representative Hansen said, uh, the, the, uh, the threat of feral pigs entering the state is, is a, a very big deal to, to the farmers that I represent. Uh, it, it'd be devastating from an environmental standpoint and also a... a a, a disease carrying standpoint from feral pigs to our domestic population. And, um, and as mentioned, the, the Eurasian wild boar uh, definitely has the ability to get established here and survive the Minnesota winters. So, um, you know, talking to the, the various uh, agencies and legislators and farmers, uh, I'm encouraged, we all want the same thing. The goal is to keep feral pigs out of the state of Minnesota. So uh, getting together and figuring out the best plan on how to make that work uh, sounds good to our organization. Uh, with that, uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify. All right, thank you, AJ. Uh, are there any other testifiers that would like to support in support with for or not on this bill? Seeing none, uh, discussion to the bill as amended. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hanson, um, not to compare Minnesota and Texas, but <clears throat> I have friends who go down there in the wintertime and they have a great old time hunting <coughs> wild pigs down there, wild boars. Any thought of a season here? Or don't we have enough of a Minnesota to say it's open season on these things and let's keep them out of Minnesota? Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Anderson, uh, they may have a good time, but they're not effective in cur curtailing or eliminating the spread, uh, no matter. And I've watched the videos too. Uh, but. Once these things get established, it's very difficult. They're very intelligent. They learn, they adapt, they evolve. Um, and so the spread has been great. And I think even, you know, back to 
Mr. Doerr, the, the winterized ones coming from the north, I think is even more of a threat because they apparently can survive in the big woods and very difficult to get them either by air or uh, trekking in. Uh, so uh, people do shoot them, but I think you, in, in the south, but I think you'll find they've had to go, you know, a lot of it's at night vi with night vision now, um, very difficult. Uh, and so the sporting, we can't take the risk of having the sport. We can't take the risk of having um, these get out and and shooting them for recreation. We have to do whatever we can to prevent them from from getting in. And that's where I think it's time, you know, to get the three agencies to to meet, work it out, work out how they're going to get this done, involve the public, uh, you know, and and have some recommendations back to us next year because uh, it's hard to do that uh, in a few weeks. But it's I think they can. I think we, they can get the data as well of how things have not worked uh, in the south and how the spread continues. So um, I'd ask for your support. Representative Anderson. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Well, there's rumors that there may be one in St. Paul, but any any estimates of the, <laughs> of the numbers that uh, may be in Minnesota already? Madam Chair, I think that might be the mascot, but I don't know if we want to go there or if it's the Floyd potentially has been back and forth uh, from uh, the, with Wisconsin, I think, right? The, so uh, the, I would have, I don't know if DNR is here um, or maybe Department of Ag. I think the last I, uh, I saw was there may be a couple of uh, released populations or DNR is here. So a couple of, of where they were, they got out and they haven't been able to be captured or eliminated. If you can please identify your, yourself before the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the record. My name is Pat Rivers, the Deputy Director of the Division of Fish and Wildlife with the Minnesota DNR. All right. I guess, do you want to respond to Representative Anderson's question? Yes, Madam Chair, we respond to, to numerous reports of feral pigs or reported loose pigs on the landscape throughout the state. I, to our knowledge, I don't believe we, we know that they are indeed established, but we know that they are on the Canadian border, and we, we continue to worry about that uh, as a source, as Representative Hanson mentioned. So it's something that's very timely for us to get together as state agencies and work together on a response, a proactive response to the threat that feral pigs uh, provide. Representative Anderson. Further discussion? Representative Harder. Thank you, Chair Vane. Uh, Representative Hansen, can you please explain, I'm just curious, on um, line 1-8, why are we moving from a fur farmer may to must register? What's the reason behind that, please? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Representative Harder, because with May, uh, the agencies don't, they don't have to register. I mean, the, and so with with the, uh, here you've got an old requirement that's essentially voluntary. And if we're going to have uh, clarity, if there is a release or if there's a disease, uh, the must register is so we have the state response. Washington, D.C. is a long ways away. But if these agencies need to work together, they need to have that registration and moving from $10 to $100 after all these years since 1985, I don't think is too much to ask. Representative Harder. Thank you, Chair Vang. How many people are registering now under their current law? Do we have any numbers on that? Commissioner Peterson, if you can please identify yourself for the record and proceed. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members, Tom Peterson, Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Agriculture. We know this uh, question because of uh, COVID. And uh, when it happened, I don't know if you remember, but we had COVID, uh, uh, minks getting COVID in different parts of the country and everything. And at the time, uh, you know, not sure what the number was, but we had less than 10 last time I checked, which was last year, registered in the state. And then checking further into that, um, probably less than half of those actually even had an uh, uh, animal. So not knowing who's out there that has any, but anecdotally, I'd say that's not far from accurate. It's pretty accurate. Representative Harder. One more question. Thank you, Chair Vang. 
Uh, so the fee right now is ten dollars, and we're going to be going to a hundred, which is quite a jump. I think I've made, you know, no bones about fees. <laughs> so you're going uh, up an extra ninety dollars. So what exactly is the department going to use? How are you going to use those extra fees? Commissioner well, Peters, maybe perhaps jump in. Um, Madam Chair, you know, so when you're issuing a license, and I used to do that, there's a cost involved. Just the management of issuing and processing and time and support, all that structure. And if you've had a voluntary system where people have been paying $10 since 1985, they've been getting a pretty good deal because I can guarantee you the cost of issuing any license is more than $10. But the commissioner could uh, clarify. Commissioner Peterson. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative Harder, uh, uh, Representative Hans. again, this isn't our bill, and I, I haven't seen like a fiscal note on the amendment, but in general, it probably costs us more than $10 to issue that, uh, uh, especially with uh, so few and everything. So when you figure out the time and the person, and we have a formula for doing that, I, I guarantee it's more than $10. But what that number is, uh, if it's 100 Again, not our bill, uh, but something you know we can always look at and everything. But in general, we have a formula and a way of figuring that out based on what it is. So uh, I would guess it's it costs the state significantly more than what they pay. Representative Harder. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion? Seeing none. Closing remarks. Representative Hanson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd ask for your support, and I'd renew my motion to uh, lay twenty three eighty seven as amended over. All right, House File 2387 is, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion. Next bill on the agenda is House File 2142, Representative Tapke. Whenever you're ready, if you can move your bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I move House File 2142 for possible inclusion and in future omnibus of this bill. All right, to your bill. Thank you. So this uh, House File 2142 is uh, goes in concert with Representative Burkle's bill that is coming up next after this. And uh, what this is is a preventative depredation for wolves. So right now there uh, are, uh, particularly in northern Minnesota, there are uh, conflict between wolves and uh, livestock, where if I, generally it's cattle, sometimes <coughs> sheep, that kind of thing, um, are uh, predated by wolves and so what this bill does is puts money into uh, avoiding that happening so that can happen from uh, by installing fences to keep wolves out of uh, livestock uh, uh, lots it can be um, there are a lot of uh, different ways of doing this with dogs that will help to keep uh, wolves out as well as mules are another way to, for this to happen. Um, and so this has been a project that's been going on for years in Minnesota. And so we have, uh, it's been federal funded, federally funded, and that funding has run out. And we need to make sure that we're putting money into this from the state. And so this has $225,000 per year for the next, uh, for this year and next year uh, for avoiding conflicts between wolves and livestock. And so Madam uh, Chair, we have a testifier as well, please. All right, our first testifier is Hannah Bernhardt from Medicine Creek Farm. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for having me to testify again today. Uh, for the record, my name is Hannah Bernhardt. Hannah, if you can speak loudly to the mic so we can hear you better. For the record, my name is Hannah Bernhardt and I run Medicine Creek Farm in Finlayson where we raise pastured beef, pork, and lamb. I would like to share my strong support for House File 2142, and I'm happy to also share the support of both the Minnesota Farmers Union and the Minnesota Farm Bureau for this bill. I raise my livestock on 160 acres of pastures in Pine County, which is a documented high wolf kill area of the state, according to the DNR. My neighbors routinely report sightings of wolf packs within a half mile of my farm, in addition to other thriving wildlife, including bear, cougar, bobcat, and coyote. As a beginning farmer, I'm fortunate to be mentored by a fellow shepherd in Pine County who advised me to use livestock guardian dogs from the very start of my operation after she experienced losing 75 lambs in 10 days when wolves first returned to the area in 1999. So I'm also fortunate to say that in my seven years raising livestock in Northern Minnesota, I've yet to experience depredation from wolves or any other predators, despite both lambing and calving out on open pasture thanks to the use of livestock guardian dogs. 
However, when I speak to other producers about these dogs, the number one concern is the cost to buy, feed, and pay for vet veterinary care, uh, especially because most people do need to keep at least two dogs to be effective against wolves. The Wolf Livestock Conflict Prevention Grant has been a great program to help producers try these dogs for the first time and experience their effectiveness. I've also personally been able to use the program to provide routine vet care for four of my dogs, totaling over $1,200, which is a major help to my bottom line, especially as a beginning farmer. And this grant also helps pay for fencing, shelters, and other prevention methods that are often expensive for, for producers to invest in. So in conclusion, this program is an extremely effective way to prevent wolf livestock conflict and support Minnesota's livestock farmers and deserves consistent public funding. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and um, anyone who has visited my farm knows how enthusiastic I am about these dogs and their impressive instincts. And so I'd be very happy to take questions and have an excuse to talk more about them. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Are there any other testifiers that would like to testify for and against this bill? All right, uh, I have no other uh, testifiers in my notes here, so we'll move to discussion. Discussion to the bill. Representative Harder. Thank you, Chair Vang. Yep. Representative Tapke, this is really a lot of money, isn't it? <laughs> I'm giving her a hard time um, from our conversation a few weeks ago or whatever. So take it in stride. Got it. Do, do, <laughs> really, I'm giving you a hard time. So uh, do we have any history on the use of this particular program? Representative Tapke. Yes, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Harder. All right. I had a hard time pegging where you were going with that one, but uh, I, am, I am appreciating having fun with this. So uh, with, um, yes, there is uh, a very good spreadsheet that we can send out to everyone with what it's been used for in the past years and how much money has gone into it. And uh, from that, and it, the most of it is uh, in fencing and guard dogs. That's where the most of the money has gone into and has helped prevent a, as you heard from the testifier, significant amount of uh, uh, issues with conflicts between wolves and livestock. Perhaps I'm harder. That's all. Thank you, Chair Vang. Thank you. I'll appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wondering if Hannah is still on the line. Is she, is she there? Hannah? Yes, I'm here. I heard you mention uh, you have some, some dogs. Um, how have they worked out? Have any dogs and uh, whatever else wolves got into any confrontations? And, and how have they, they turned out? Hannah? Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Representative Anderson. So I have not had any direct conflicts. The way that these dogs work is mostly as a preventative. So just the fact of having the dogs on my property um, it basically signifies to the wolves in the area that there's someone already occupying this territory. And for the most part, then the wolves just simply avoid the area. Now the dogs do work by barking through the night and so they will bark if they see or smell or hear any sort of predatory activity nearby. But um, most of their work is done just as a prevention. Representative Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was interesting. Representative Tabke, um, you're increasing the funding to the program, and yet it looks like it's never utilized its full funding. And this goes back to 2015. So why the increase in funding when it's never been fully utilized in any of the years we've had it to, in place. Representative Tapke. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Anderson. This is what uh, the advocates feel um, is appropriate for this, what can be utilized if, because uh, quite a few folks they've heard from have not uh, applied for the program because they didn't think they'd qualify and those kinds of things. And I think this is what the need is out there today for what uh, can be used, but everything will carry over if it is not uh, utilized. Representative Anderson. Further discussion to the bill? Seeing none, uh, closing remarks, Representative Tapke. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Vang and members for hearing this. We uh, uh, heard this bill also in 2019 uh, as well, and we had uh, for 
I think it's probably just uh, Representative Anderson now that was uh, on at that time. We had a very colorful uh, testifier at that time, which was a lot of fun. And um, so it was uh, good. So this is a really great uh, program that helps to prevent problems and what I think that we should be using funds like this for. Uh, also, uh, to solve the problems before they become more expensive. So uh, thank you very much, Chair Vang, and I hope this is included. Uh, renew my motion for this to be included in a future omnibus bill. All right, House File 2142 is laid over for possible inclusion. The next bill we have is Representative Burkle, House File 127. Whenever you're ready, Representative Burkle, if you can move your bill. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that House File 127 be laid over for possible inclusion. All right. Uh, the bill is before us. I see that you have an author's amendment, the A1. Uh, would you please move your A1 amendment? Yeah, I'd like to move the A1 amendment, Madam Chair. Thank All you. Right. To the A1. The A1 amendment, um, when I drafted the bill back uh, early in the session, uh, was, was a blank appropriation. Uh, this would match the Senate language at $250,000 per year, making it a half million dollars over the biennium. All right. Discussion to the A1. Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the A1 say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The motion prevails. The A1 is adopted. Uh, now to uh, the bill as amended. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this bill would appropriate the money, as you just saw in the A1 amendment, uh, $250,000 a year, up from the uh, 175 uh, in the past. Um, any unencumbered balances would be carried forward year on year. And, and so this is for both wolf and elk depredation. Um, if unused money in, uh, or, or if they use more money in the elk depredation program, they'd take money from the wolf to cover the, the expense. Um, but it would carry over that year. Um, producers have kind of counted on these accounts, especially in my district up in, especially in Kitson County, uh, with a couple of elk herds there and, and in the Grigla area up in Marshall County. Uh, we have one small elk herd there as well. Um, and they've counted on these accounts for reimbursement when wolves kill um, or injure livestock or when uh, elk damage fence or crops up there. Um, appreciate Representative Tapke's bill. I'm glad to be a co-author on it. And those mitigation strategies work well, and I can even speak from experience in the past having used uh, lights and, and alarms and, and uh, other mitigation strategies to try and keep wolves away from my farm. But uh, at some point, Inevitably, especially out uh, with cattle and livestock, you see that happen. And, and this, this program would just uh, fund that depredation program. I think we have some testifiers from Farm Bureau and, and others as well. Uh, I don't see the testifier sketch here in my notes, but if there's anyone that would like to testify, okay. please uh, proceed to the testifying table and identify yourself before the committee. Greetings, Chair Vang and members of the committee. My name is Miles Kushel. I, as pointed out, I want to apologize. I did not wear my hat today, so I've been pointed out on several occasions that I'm uh, un uninconspicuous today. But uh, like I said, my name is Miles Kushel, and I'm testifying today in support of House File 127. On behalf of the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation, representing nearly 30,000 farmers and ranchers across the state of Minnesota, along with several other organizations, Organizations. I also wish to bring it to your attention that Minnesota Farmers Union is also in support of House File 127. I am from Cass County and serve on the Minnesota Farm Bureau Board of Directors. The district I represent encompasses northeastern Minnesota, which encompasses nearly all of the historic, historical wolf territory within the state. Although the current wolf range has expanded almost to the Red River Valley to the west and as far south as the Noka and Chisago counties. The issue of wolves prep excuse me, wolf depredation is front and center reality for our third generation ranch. I operate with my family, raising the fourth generation. Additionally, I actively served on the state's wolf plan advisory committee, playing a role in creating a management plan that hopefully one day will be utilized in the state of Minnesota for the betterment of wolves and the farms and the ranches they interface with. Being from wolf territory, I know how devastating livestock loss is due to depredation. These instances are difficult to manage, hard to verify, and due to the current management restrictions because of the gray wolf's protected federal status, farmers and ranchers are often left with nothing to turn to but the depredation fund. 
Although we wish to change the federal status, we know that it is not a current reality, putting producers in a position of best utilizing current management practices and seeking help after the depredation incident has occurred. This speaks to the importance of the fund and why we thank Representative Burkle for bringing this bill forward along with the other co-authors. House File 127 would appropriate funding for the depredation fund for the 24 and 25 fiscal years, continuing to give producers access to much needed reconciliation in the event of a catastrophic loss created by wolf depredation. I thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any other testifiers that would like to testify on this bill? Okay, uh, I see no more testifiers. We'll move to discussion. Representative Cha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you give me some numbers on how many uh, cases are we seeing per year and is it declining or is it increasing? Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can just speak. I'll speak specifically to the elk depredation since that's what I've seen the most of. And, and technically, if you look at the numbers, the wolf depredation numbers by a year have kind of declined. Um, the elk depredation numbers are up quite a bit substantially. In fact, um, back in 2017, it was $38,000, give or take, and we're up to $180,000 in 22. Um, the last few years have seen, I mean, we've seen three years in a row, of well over $100,000 in elk depredation claims in Kitson County. Um, you might want to speak more to the wolf depredation side of it. Mr. Miles, if you could identify yourself again. Miles Kushel. Thank you, Chair Vang and Representative Cha. Um, we're seeing uh, stabilized numbers on the wolf depredation side, but I believe that is due to the uh, amount of cattle that we lost during the drought. Farmers um, depopulated their herds. So in uh, 2019, we saw 78 instances. 2020, we saw 76. 21, we saw 77. And 22, we saw 78. But um, there's still 14 claims pending for the years of 21, and there's still two claims pending for the 2022 season. In terms of dollars amount, uh, in 21, we've seen $146,000. In 22, we've seen $100,000. Um, for the future years, I can tell you that the livestock industry, uh, price-wise, is on the increase. So as the claims on average have been about $1,200, I expect to see those claims increase uh, per livestock animal in the coming years. Representative Cha. And can you give me insight on the wolf population? Is it increasing or decreasing? Representative Burkle. I think the numbers we've seen, I mean, if you're talking about me and possibly DNR might want to chime in on this, um, I, I know the numbers are increasing by, by a reasonable amount in our district, at least I've seen quite a few. I think uh, we were at a meeting in Crookston a few years, two years ago, I think it was, and you um, intimated that in Cass County, even now that you're seeing them north of Moorhead. Um, so the range has expanded. I don't have actual numbers, but if someone from DNR, I think Peter's here from DNR. So. Is there anyone from DNR that can help answer the question? If you can last, sorry, I think it was 2,700 was the number I'd heard last. But. Yeah, please identify yourself for the record. Madam Chair, Pat Rivers, Deputy Director for the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the wolf population has been relatively stable over the last several years and ranging from about 2,500 to 3,000 per year. Uh, so what Representative Porter said, about 2,700 animals. Okay, Representative Cha. Thank you, though, for the questions. Further discussion? Seeing none, closing remarks, Representative Burkle. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I think uh, enough has been said. I, you know, we've seen, uh, as we've seen from our testifiers and, and, and as my personal experience up in Kitson County, um, we, you know, especially if we're going to see the elk herd, elk management plan change in our county up there, there's talk of maybe expansion of that herd up there. and. Uh, I think elk depredation claims have, have increased substantially. I think increasing the number to $250,000 makes sense, as my amendment outlined. Um, and with that, uh, just knowing that our, our farmers up in that area rely on this, uh, if we're going to keep those elk herds going, um, I'd renew my motion to lay over House File 127. All right, House File 127 is laid over for possible inclusion. The next bill that we have is House File 2299, Representative Anderson. Whenever you're ready, Representative Anderson, um, please move your bill. Thank you. 
Thanks, Madam Chair. I'd like to move House File 2299 All right. for possible inclusion. All right. To your bill, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This, this bill <clears throat> goes after kind of a maybe not as high profile a depredation area as elk and wolves and things like that. This is concerning deer deprivation. And although you know, it may not be as dramatic, uh, uh, many farmers have talked to me out of, out of frustration after seeing their, their silage piles decimated, seeing their rows of uh, round bales decimated. I saw a picture the other day. It was a, a, a row of, of, of bales inside a fence, by the way, that were uh, knocked down to, to nothing. And there was a, a herd of deer standing there finishing up eating. And um, just, just the frustration. And it could amount to hundreds of dollars in terms of, of feed lost uh, over the winter time when, when uh, you, you count on your, your available feed supply to get you through the winter. And then if uh, something like this happens to ruin a big part of your, your feed supply, it, it puts you kind of behind the eight ball. And what this bill does, Madam Chair, it sets up a, not my favorite thing, but a study group to uh, look at the issue and to come back with some recommendations in terms of what we could do to, uh, to uh, help farmers financially uh, when these types of things happen. Um, I have a testifier, Madam Chair, and would like to hear from him now, if we could. All right, uh, Brad Hovo, if you can please identify yourself before the committee and proceed. <clears throat> Brad Hovo with the Minnesota Soybean Growers Association. Hello, committee, Madam Chair and committee, Brad Hovel. I farm in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, southeast to here with my, uh, my folks and my brother. I have a few examples of some of the damage we've had to growing crops uh, from deer in our area. Um, we have a farm in Cannon Falls Township and Vesa Township, which butts up on the north and the west sides of that farm, but up to DNR land. <clears throat> this farm... This one parcel of land is about 207 acres, and it's got a lot, and 50 acres of that is headlands, which is basically the 90-foot perimeter around the field where we turn around and do stuff. Uh, and that's about 36 rows of, uh, of crop on, that, on them headlands, which, which is the outside edge of the field. Those headlands, those 50 acres of headlands, average 12 bushel per acre of soybeans. Normally, the base of the field, or the majority of the field, averages 50 bushel soybeans per acre. So at $15 beans, the losses on just the outside rounds of this farm was a loss of $28,500 on just the headlands. In addition, we do some uh, detriment or some treatments on the field to try and deter the deer. We spray, spray Plantsid, which is a blood-based uh, um, spray that we can spray on the foliage to deter the deer from eating because it, it smells like blood out there. That's only a short-term fix when it comes to, to deer eating our crops in the field because if bear decide to move into our area, that'll attract bear and that could cause more damage as well. Um, so what that cost of spraying that stuff is about $15 per acre and an application rate of $8 to, to run the sprayer across the field and you have to do that twice. So that adds up to about $5,520. So a total loss on just this one farm, out of, out of pocket, with open hunting on two sides of the farm, we had a loss of about $34,200 on just this one farm. Another farm we were able to salvage a crop on is where we sprayed that plant at the blood-based deterrent on 85 acres at a cost of $15 per acre, an application rate of $8 an acre, with a total out-of-pocket cost of $3,910. At least we were able to salvage that particular field. And in addition, we have one other field, a 25-acre field, that averaged eight bushel per acre. There wasn't enough foliage there to even attempt to spray any of the plants sit on to help deter anything. Uh, so that field there, did eight bushels, should have been 50. So with that loss of uh, soybeans produced in that field, the total losses on that farm was $15,750. In addition to not only the crop damage we're seeing in the soybean fields, we're also seeing it in corn fields. 
where the headlands and end rows are getting really beat up by the deer. And uh, like Representative Anderson said about the, the feed storage for our cows and stuff, uh, we have some, some tubes of baleage in the neighborhood, which is baled wet hay and wrapped in plastic where deer have actually ripped the plastic, clawed through it and started eating. And if you figure a, a tube of bales at about 70 bales long at $70 a bale, that's about five grand in, uh, in damages with all the wrap and stuff like that per tube of feed. So, they, I mean, the, the dollars really, really add up to, uh, to what it, uh, the luxury we have of looking at wildlife actually costs us out in rural Minnesota here. So, if you have any questions, it's... All right. Are there any other testifiers that would like to testify on this bill? Seeing none, we'll have discussion. Representative Jacob. Uh, thank you, Chair Bang. In my neighborhood, we've got really a lot of organic farmers. So it, it, it really affects them at a much higher rate because of the price of that crop. I mean, they're looking at a lot of times triple, quadruple, conventional prices. So um, are you seeing that in your area or are you talking just about help here for conventional agriculture. Mr. Hovell. Madam Chair, Representative Jacob. Jacob. Um, it, it goes across all different types of crops. I mean, what we have particularly, particularly in our area is conventional stuff, uh, but it, it definitely, it, it affects everybody the same. There's, there's truly not enough resources to go out and try and control the ever-expanding population of the white-tailed deer, and there's not enough fence to put up around every farm field or anything because we tip, we don't have enough gate openers. Representative Jacob. Oh, thank you. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make a comment quick because I've had the same calls uh, from my district as well, in particular with the CWD feeding ban. Um, we've seen a lot of deer congregating in even greater numbers on farms and the concerns I've heard from from farmers back home is not just the cost of the feed but the fact that larger numbers of deer are congregating on these farms and they're worried about disease issues there as well so um, I think it's a good bill and I'm glad to be a co-author and I think it's um, we, we kind of need to know what we're dealing with there um, I, I will say that the DNR was very good the last couple of years of uh, would have been my first term I had more calls actually in 20 and 21, or 21 and 22 uh, relative to, to deer depredation up north because the winter was so harsh. Um, so good bill, I'm glad to support it. Representative Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Anderson, for this bill. I think it's uh, important to take a look at this. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm hearing, I'm hearing from both farmers in my area, and I'm hearing from sportsmen, because uh, one of the issues we have is as the, the farms that do have feed, the, the deer are moving towards them, especially in a year like this, uh, you know, we're kind of record snowfall, a little bit harder to forage for food. And uh, with the deer moving, it has also left areas of, uh, some of this is, uh, you know, state-owned state, uh, state -owned land or, you know, hunting land that people have, sportsmen have, and they're seeing a reduced numbers of deer. So they're wanting, you know, less licenses but yet their farmers are saying, we're seeing more and more damage. And we're, we're kind of at a, at a crossroads. And another thing that we have, uh, Pine County is uh, very high on the, the list of wolf depredation. And I, I think that also um, plays into that of, you know, our wolf pack are, are moving around. So I think their deer are herding up in greater numbers. And they're, they're moving some of the well, I don't have any research that proves it, just uh, anecdotal evidence of where, where deer are and where they are not uh, ends up congregating them into a few smaller areas. And so it is becoming an issue. And I think, uh, you know, studying this, while I, I uh, understand your sentiment on a, a working group, uh, I think uh, we all have enough frustration with them. I, I think it's important to take a look at this and try to get a, a better understanding and hopefully we can get some 
ideas on how best to to take care of this because I, I think we we need all the animals there. We don't want to eradicate the deer, but at the same time, uh, it is it is real cost that is you know affecting our our farms and our you know our sportsmen community as well because they're not seeing the deer on their parcels. So thank you, uh, Representative Anderson. I just have a quick question on the. Uh, appropriation. Uh, how did you arrive at $100,000 for the working group and uh, what do you uh, expect the group to be using the funds for? Madam Chair, that was a kind of a stab in the dark. Um, don't quite know how big this working group has to be. Uh, I did have a bill that just appropriated money for deprivation and it wasn't a whole lot more than this, but uh, I'm just glad that we are going to get something moving on this and, and I think we could probably get this group together on less than 100,000. So if you could see anything uh, that we could uh, use to get this group together, I think we'd be uh, thankful to get uh, maybe a little bit smaller amount. Okay. Further discussion? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Anderson. And I, I wanna just caution a couple things. One is that you know the outcome doesn't predetermine that all of a sudden we're gonna have a new program uh, that's going to fund this. I, I want to reduce expectations on that. I think it's important to look at what the costs are and who should pay those costs. Um, and I think that's a valuable thing to look at. Uh, there are differences with wolves and with elk. Uh, with wolves, you had a protected species and you had consequences for that protected species. Uh, with elk, it's a couple of very small remnant populations uh, that are unique, but they do do damage. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to think about what happens with increasing spread of CWD and what that may do. We already have a, a rapidly aging hunting population, and we have people dropping out of hunting. And if you have fewer and fewer hunters, then your population, uh, then your control is either the wolves or the cars. And uh, that's, both of those would have consequences. And so um, things, you know, nature can get out of whack on things. And uh, we, have a, we have a lot of deer, but we manage for deer for the hunt. But now people may be stopping hunting because of the disease, which then leads to other cascading effects. So um, I think that should be taken into consideration uh, when we're looking at this is what happens with reduction in the number of hunters, which is likely to continue uh, despite all the efforts on it, and how does that impact predation on all crops and the consequence also for people. Um, uh, accidents, and uh, they have a consequence as well as an economic consequence uh, for people. So, thanks. Representative Cha. Thank you, Manager. Is uh, DNR still here? believe so. Can you give us a uh, number roughly on the deer population in Minnesota and the amount of license you've uh, handed out last year and also the uh, amount of deer harvested? Uh, Patrick? Madam Chair, Pat Rivers, Deputy Director of the Division of Fish and Wildlife. We don't have a statewide number, although the number 1 million deer has been batted around for a while. But what we do have is we know we have roughly 500,000 deer hunters, and last year we harvested about 170,000 deer. We have deer hunting opportunities starting in mid-September, going all the way through December 31st, and we've had special hunts related to CWD uh, special hunts. So we have plenty of opportunities for hunters to be on the landscape. One of the challenges is, some of the, the challenges that, that farmers have is they need help in June and July. And that's something that is difficult to do with the hunting season. But we look forward to working with Department of Ag and others about how we can address some of these issues. Representative Cha. Thank you for that information. Further discussion? Seeing on closing remarks, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to kind of comment on what Representative Hansen said, um, I, I hear you. But I think farmers feel a sense of frustration in that uh, they see their, their standing crops like our testifier talked about and, and see a real dollar loss or see their feed supply get, uh, get uh, ruined. And 
you know, the DNR has some programs available to help with fencing and things like that. And, and what, I hear, what I hear from farmers is they don't have any money left. And the deer kind of depredation kind of gets pushed down to, uh, it doesn't rise up to the level of, of the elk and uh, the wolf depredation. But the frustration is there, and I'll just relate one story, I think we have time. Not just what you'd call farm crops, there's a, a guy in my area, a town of Terrace, a really pretty little town with a river going through it and a dam, and he has a Christmas tree farm. And a couple of years ago, it's in the wintertime when the deer herd up, and he lost one entire year's planting of, of Christmas trees. And I think Christmas trees are about a seven-year project from when you plant them to when you can harvest them for, for Christmas trees. So he lost one whole year's production because the deer liked those little saplings or, or whatever you call them and had, had dessert with those things all winter time and took out one whole year's production. And, you know, that hurt him economically a great deal. So um, I think it's something we need to look at. And again, I'm not sure about the levels of financing or how much, how much we should put to it, but farmers are frustrated and um, don't feel they should uh, be footing the bill for feeding a lot of our state's deer herd um, when it hurts them, hurts themselves financially. So with that, Madam Chair, I would renew my motion to lay House File 2299 over for possible inclusion. All right. House File, 22, House file 2299 is laid over for possible inclusion. Members, that is all the items we have on our agenda today. Our next meeting is on Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. Uh, there is a possibility we might have a Friday uh, morning committee if, uh, if we don't finish our Thursday's agenda. So just be aware. Uh, and with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>